Hallo, ik is Valtje Kitri Shaskit, de program. Ik heb BBC Alba, ik heb Kordig en de Borden in één dag, ik creëer Spars en Halbe. Is Michelle Valentijn, ik zou me toch wel graag willen dat je daar allemaal privilege naar bent, voor je niet kunt er kolorum is in studio. Het programma is heel genoeg, we beginnen met Fiona Sulerash en Shaskin voor Ella aan zijn SWPL. Hanif Guthrie is heel graag en maar hij heeft dan de United Suzuki SWPL hun. Ik is Atri Shaskit, een gal in de rij, Kolarij en Van Alimpoch, Polly Swan. Fiona, welkom bij 360. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you again. Good to see you too. And there's also so much to talk about because since the last time you were on, your job has changed for a few months. So actually, if you can just tell us all about that, how that came about and actually what you're working on. Yeah, so you're right. There's been a lot <laughs> going on in the last few months since I've been here. I've been seconded over to the SPFL um, on a part-time basis to lead the delivery of the new competitions, the new SWPL 1 and 2. Uh, so that's come about after the review we took, took place last year. The SWPL clubs have decided they want to come under the banner of the SPFL from next year. Uh, so my role for the next four months is to essentially establish that, get that set up so that we're good to kick off uh, next season. But at the same time, I've still got some of my Scottish FA remit in terms of working with the national teams and performance part in particular. So tell us about the new leagues. How, what, I mean, what did you have to work on first? What is coming up what <laughs> tell us from the start well there's a few kind of parallel work streams there's not one thing we've got about four months to get everything set up so as you can imagine there's a lot to be done there's the the bits that everyone would expect in terms of the competitions themselves so we'll have a 12 team premier league one and an 18 premier league two with promotion and relegation so sorting out the, the kind of mechanics of the competition is probably the first thing that you want to do and understand what the competitions are going to look like but behind the scenes, as you can imagine, there's a million other things to be done in terms of the IT, the registrations processes. We'll go through a bit of a rebrand as well, so the competitions will look and feel different just to um, put a marker in the sand that this is a new era for women's football in the Premier League, so there'll be a new look and feel to the leagues from next year. And then, obviously, just the normal things you do when you're running elite competitions around commercial partners and broadcast partners. So. Yeah, there's a lot of bits and pieces going on at the same time, but it's really exciting and I'm just lucky to be a part of it. When can we expect to see the new look from this league? Uh, I think I would say probably into June, so around about the time that the fixtures and things would come out, we'd anticipate the new look and feel. If we're really work lucky we're working with UEFA on that as well. The clubs will all be involved in that process, so it's really important that the new league feels and looks as the clubs want it to. It's their league, so it's got to be something that they identify with and they've been through the journey over the years in terms of what their clubs have all been through collectively to get to where we are so that's part of the job that I'm particularly excited about and I think that's one of the, the meetings that most people will want to be involved in. So you'll have the two leagues you'll also have a league cup but even just with the leagues will there be a new name they're currently called SWPL 1 and 2 Scottish Women's Premier League 1 and 2 will that be will they be called something different? I don't think we'll deviate too far from that, but through that rebranding process, we'll decide that for certain. So I don't think you'll see something hugely different, but that'll be for the clubs and that sort of rebrand process to, to confirm over the next few months. And what about the League Cup? How will that start to look? We're still deciding that at the moment. We're just deciding whether to stick with the group stage, which was the previous format, or whether to revert back to uh, the knockout format. There's more league games this year by the nature of there being more teams in the competition. So we need to work out from a calendar perspective what works, so at the moment we're just deciding whether that will be a, a knockout format or we'll kind of start with that group stage as we have done recently. And have you been working closely with the teams just now? What, has there been any feedback of what's really important to them with this new, with this huge new change? Yeah, I think the clubs will probably be fed up of hearing from me fairly soon. We speak very regularly. We have a working group that's set up that has eight clubs, so six from PL1 and two from PL2. So that working group are doing a lot of the legwork in terms of looking at the rules, the articles of association, the commercial rules, all that sort of paperwork that will underpin that new league. Um, but there's also broader communication going out to, to all the teams that are going to participate in the league. So we're very much working alongside the clubs because it's really important that it's representative of what they want. So everything from the rules to the articles to how decisions are made is going to be led by the clubs. and. Even the way the company's structured, the directors, there'll always be a majority of club directors on the board, which means that the clubs very much still have their destiny in their own hands, and it's women's football clubs making decisions for women's football, which is one of the things that was really important from the outset, having conversations with the clubs. What's really important for you to see 
with this change? What do you want to see from next season and really push on the women's game in Scotland? It's all about progress. I think when you look back, you realise how far the game has come. But through the piece of work we did with the Scottish FA strategy, it was all about how do we accelerate that growth and take the game to the next level. So we want to see that improvement on the pitch in terms of the, the level of the games that people are now taking part in and we're going to watch. And that's all about the infrastructure that the clubs can provide for their players. So the, the closer that is to a professional environment in terms of sports science and the level of coaching and the number of training sessions per week, the better we'll see the product on the pitch. So we just have to work collaboratively with the clubs to help facilitate that. Um, and that's, I think, one of the drivers was to professionalise the competitions and the governance and decision making. But also there's that drive to bring in those extra commercial and broadcast revenues because those revenues will in turn go back into the clubs and allows them to invest. So it's a real cycle of things that all join together to try and make the overall product better for everyone. Is that something that you're hoping to see more of in the top league as more perfect, more teams turning professional? Yeah, and it's, I think it's not just about the players being professional in terms of the technicality of that term. It's not about them necessarily all being on professional contracts. We know that clubs have got different challenges, but it's about the environment being professional. So when the players go to training, they have an appropriate pitch space, they have sports science, they have nutrition advice, they, they have um, analysts, all those things that create that performance environment, they are really, really important. In an ideal world, we want more players to be professional. As a female, imagine having that opportunity that you can become a professional football player. So of course we want more professional female players, but at the same time, it's more important that the environment that's created is a professional one. Right now there is still a bit of uncertainty with, in terms of this season, what's going to happen with relegation and promotion from SWPL2. Do you have an update on that, of what teams can expect going into the latter stages of the season? Yeah, so we are 12 team Premier League 1, which means that two teams will come up from Premier League 2 at the end of this season. I think the important point here is that the pyramid still exists below Premier League 2. So it isn't a case of Premier League 1 and 2 are now taken to the side and there's a no entry sign, it's far from that. The pyramid will still exist and flow down into SWS top competition, which is the championship at the moment. And that's where that communication between myself and SWF is really important as well and to make sure that the club's sitting in the championship at the moment know how that structure is going to look going forward from the SWPL's perspective because they are aspirational and striving to get into that Premier League 2. And the same for the clubs in Premier League 2. They're aware if they're relegated, they'll move down to the, the Championship, obviously. So it's really important that that line of communication is really, really solid between us and SWF. So we're still kind of waiting for clarity on what will happen with SWPL 1 this season in terms of of relegation, is that something that's still in conversation right now? Yeah, we're still discussing it, but essentially the, the plan at the moment would be that there would be no relegation, the two teams from Premier League 2 would come up and that would give you the 12 for next season, um, and then teams would come up from the Championship to fill the spots that are left to make up the eight-team Premier League 2, so that's, the, that's certainly the plan at the moment that we are working towards. And we do know already that Dundee United from SWPL 2 will be heading up, um, they won the league, they must be delighted, it must be even exciting for you just to have just to know that they'll be on their way up now yeah and it's funny i know um justine mitchell who started the team she was on the swf board at the same time as i was and um, when that team was set up and justine was quite a driving factor in dundee united women's team being established so that doesn't seem that long ago so it's quite scary now to think how quickly they've moved up through the leagues and um, I think from their perspective you know, they've run away with the league this year they're unbeaten I believe so to do that in any league's quite an achievement um, so it's great to see another club coming up that will add value and credit to the teams that have come up previously if you look at Aberdeen, Partick Thistle and Hamilton they've all competed pretty well this year and all had some results against you know some of the teams at the top half of the table so I'm sure Dundee United will do the same. Great well that works perfectly for our first feature coming up Fiona. Our son of Furachle Dundee United, who is in Fachel or Neve Guthrie, who chicken skipper, and via Bunig SWPL Ya Good Game Echau. Dundee United, Neve Guthrie, or Ajahook at a shack in your Avish of Head of Yan, as Jayam Bornhook Aka and some SWP Laya. Ayas and Glossadaka could improve League Albanoch and on Balkoshin and Ban. 
Yeah, I don't think it's sunk in yet because I just think like that was like our aim at the start of the season. It's just like happened so soon with like still five games to go. So I just can't get over it and everyone's just buzzing still. So I think it's just a relief that is done and we've done the job. So I think it's just like an unbelievable feeling, like knowing that next season will be like in the top flight of like Scottish women's football. So I think that was everyone's like dream to get like achieve that. And I think it's just like everyone's still in shock. So it's just like an unbelievable feeling to actually say that we've won the league. It is a new shen dive latch at a hackers and skipper at Dundee United ahead of the early Kutmox and Tlia Sarvachalaka. Her new Kutjaka Gajaku, Gabelli Marha Ketherard, can season her oil. I think it's just like everyone, everyone's positivity and like just us coming together as a group, like at training, like we've not stopped working hard and like just putting everything into like behind the scenes, like what we eat and stuff like that as well. Like every little bit adds up to like make sure that we win every week. And like not every game's been like easy at all. Like we've had our ups and downs, but we've always came like pushing through to actually get the like three points or like a draw. So it's good to say that we've been unbeaten so far and hopefully keep this up for the rest of the season. I think the main aim is to like keep keep the like winning streak kind of going and like not dropping any points because even though we've still won, we still want to keep that like no loss like throughout the season so I think our heads won't go down at all I think we'll keep working hard but we just need to keep in mind like like going towards that kind of mindset of not dropping our standards at all or anything and basically getting our fitness up for like preparation for next season because that'll be much like higher standards that we'll have to aim for to actually get success. It's just unbelievable thinking that we'll be playing against likes like Rangers, Glasgow City, Celtic and all the other teams. Like it's always been a dream of mine to like play against them and everything. So like even just to get like noticed, like playing on like television, like getting the highlights on the show, like that's just amazing. Like it's always been a dream of mine. So I'm really happy. I'm buzzing to go already, to be honest. Had Guthrie a tosh parsh more Jay Behe to Balkosha. I just had a doy glan a fakin and brew at the Clue it could eat a search and an alibi, a cheating boo. Yeah, so ever since like I kind of first joined the team, because I always played outside like with my dad in the garden and then signed up to go to Four for Farming in. And then ever since then I've just always like played football. Like I wouldn't know any different if I didn't like play football to be honest. Like it's always been in my lifestyle and so it's always just been a dream to like go as far as I can and like at the highest level. The pathway I've kind of took is like so much different to what I like ever imagined like I went to like different school because of football and left all my mates behind like it's just mental like everything that I've like like not sacrificed but like chose like oh, like to like aspire for football. Who need you all is loch for the skipper for you shach when you jerk the halibut? I just hide in the ark with the hoodie shot if you fast on click it that high in you. High and Dawkins can first go bow kosher and can play of league Doris Yee to skip in the Halibut East. I was involved with the Scotland under 17s like kind of like last year and two years ago kind of thing. So we were playing in like the Euros and stuff and that's like a different level come like playing against different countries, like very professional, like just the way we prepped like for matches, training, like it was like really high standards and everything so that taking it into like club football has really like set me in like knowing like where my mindset needs to be like before games and like how I need to like set myself to like play well and everything. I want to go like as far as like I can go really like I want to like aim to get back like in the Scotland set up so like kind of now it's like the A team so that's like any age really so that'll be like really difficult but I think getting promotion will kind of like set me kind of there hopefully get noticed and stuff again so like playing against like all these teams hopefully will get me like noticed and even to like just continue getting picked for Scotland would be mental it'd be like a dream. Had on the United if Jan Erdis a Hruhu or some length in Oris a hit season after to SWPL Hoon I is a mishnach at Neve, gunurin in skip at Ike be servical. I want to see us kind of like setting a good standard, like first going into the league, saying that like we're here to like challenge everyone, like no matter who, 
we're playing against and just to kind of keep bringing like players in and making them feel welcome because everyone that's like joined like during this season said like how good of a bunch we are and I want to keep that kind of like team environment like very open to like say what how you feel and everything so that and basically just like putting in your own hard work at home like doing your own wee bits and stuff so I think that'll help us like progress as a team. Fiona, what a brilliant journey for Dundee United. Can you actually just tell us some of your own connections with the team? Yeah, it's funny. I obviously know Justine Mitchell from her time on the SWF board. And back at that time, she had just set up Dundee United. And I remember at the time, one of the younger players in the team was Tammy Harkin, who I played against. She actually played, I think, in the last game I played when I got an injury. And she's now obviously become, she's been through that whole journey with them from the lower leagues up to Premier League and I think scored a hat-trick just last week to become Dundee United's all-time top goal scorer. So it's amazing in such a short space of time what they've achieved. But I know from the outset when they set up, their ambition was to get to Premier League One. So it'll be a really proud moment for those that are there, but maybe those that aren't there but contributed along the way, they'll be really proud that they've made it there. And if we just put that into perspective, when you played Tammy, what was that, 2012 you were saying? I think it was 2012, uh, and that was one of the last games I ever played. I got a horrendous injury in that game, um, and she was playing for Murray at the time, if I recall right. Um, and she was one of the younger players, but obviously had a lot of ability, and she's moved to Dundee United. and clearly never look back and we'll be a Premier League one player next year. It's, it's amazing to hear, it's amazing to hear Neve. it's amazing to hear that story of your connection with, with the players too and Justine because it has been such a short amount of time for Dundee United to come together and now they're heading into SWPL1, which you heard from Neve there, even just having that media exposure means so much. What will that do for the club? I think, I think what was really nice was to hear the excitement in Neve's voice about being in Premier League one. It wouldn't have been that long ago that materially you wouldn't have seen a huge difference apart from the quality on the pitch, but to hear that she's excited about being on the Highlights programme on a Monday night, she knows that every week there'll be a floor, she'll be playing in some form of stadium on occasion against full-time players that are internationals, not just for Scotland now. I think now you're beginning to see the Premier League one has a real prestige about it and you could really sense that excitement through, through Neve and that she's really looking forward to that opportunity. And what a season for Dundee United to be coming up like we just spoke about at, about at the start of the programme, all this change happening, I mean, is there a, a better time for them to be coming up? I think it's a brilliant time for them to come up and to win it early gives them a little bit more lead in because then they can start to plan and look ahead to next season with a bit of, sort of confidence and certainty that they'll know that they're going to be in Premier League One. But, you know, it shouldn't be lost in amongst all of this. That to win any league is not easy because you've got to keep your standards high across the whole season. A cup, sometimes you can see a bit of an upset because teams have an off day, but I think to win the league, it, it does point to the best team in that competition. And they've obviously been really strong and consistent this year. And they appear to have a really close-knit group of players and you hope they maintain that and keep that sort of camaraderie as they move up together into Premier League One. And as Neve said, they've clearly got that mindset as a group that the top league was their aim and to achieve it, I mean, six years, it's not a long time to actually do what they've done. Does that give hope for more teams, more uh, women's teams around Scotland who have watched Dundee United from start to finish and think, OK, we can do that too. I mean, for example, we had Grampian Ladies on the show a few weeks ago and their aim also is to make it, to break it into the top league. So does that give hope for more teams out there? Of course, I mean, it can be done. We've seen even Aberdeen a few years ago were down in the third tier of Scottish football and I was with the club at the time when they were down in the sort of lower leagues and they reset and went again and made it up to Premier League and are now competing and have some brilliant young players. Dundee United the same. They started from a sort of zero base and have built their way up through, through the league. So it's definitely possible and I think that's the important thing about the new competitions being set up the pyramid still exists and that flow of teams up and down is still absolutely possible and I think that's an important message for everyone to understand that a team like Grampian, if they have the ambition and they do well on the field, then that opportunity exists for all clubs in Scotland to play in the Premier League. Well, even if we just talk about Aberdeen that you just mentioned, Aberdeen parted this on Hamilton, all came up to the top league last season and even though Hamilton are sitting bottom, there have been some really close games between all three clubs and who you'd say are the kind of top teams in SWPL1, SWPL sorry, Celtic Rangers and Glasgow City. I mean, it shows that teams can come up 
and really press, even though if results aren't going their way, the quality is there. Yeah, and I think we're, we're in a, the time now we are competitive, there's a real competitiveness to the league. Um, I think when you look at fixtures now, there's not the same certainty over, um, you know, Glasgow City will definitely win that. They've had tough games against Partick Thistle, Hamilton, you know, Aberdeen have run Rangers close. You know, there's been a number of games where you look and think, these teams are really competing. Where you see the difference is usually in the second half because the teams that are full time quite often physically have that little bit more to get them over the line. Um, but we're certainly seeing far more competitive games and I think Dundee United will definitely add to that mix because they'll be coming up to compete. They'll want to stay in the league but they'll want to compete and they'll fancy their chances against your, you know, the teams that you've just spoken about, Aberdeen and Partick Thistle, and to show that, that they belong there. So you know, a really exciting addition to the Premier League. It certainly is and a huge congratulations to Dundee United. Absolutely. We'll have an Olympoch police one. A geisha gain, Maragarihi and Trenagaich gear, Sonia Pan, see a chili gopar, my gotter, thrown a pandemic. Nur a hoshi he van breath in your poly swan a gimmerox and art skull. Her Kali yes I gig and for a talent that you gig in the Olympic sea. Um so I started at school, so I was at um Harriet's in Edinburgh. Um and it was just on the canal, uh just like as you do kind of after school and just really enjoyed it. Um I wasn't that good, I was kind of the girl with potential, but long limbs and a bit mal coordinated, like I said, and I think it was more a case of, because I kept going at it, I suddenly started getting a bit better <laughs> rather than particular talent. Um, and I wasn't very good at pushing myself, which kind of you need to be able to do when you're a rower. So it just took me a wee while to kind of get myself, I suppose, grown up and a bit more like feisty. Um, so it wasn't until, so I was at university at Edinburgh, um, Edinburgh Uni, and was still rowing and really enjoying it. Um, but it wasn't probably until I was about 21, 22, where th things started showing that actually I did have the potential and was getting better. So I was rowing over um, at Glasgow Rowing Club over in Glasgow under a coach called George Warnock. Um, and he was kind of my entry into elite sports. So I did the under 23s under him and then um, kind of made the big jump and decided to move down south and try for the 2012 Olympics. Er skask and the Yoshi here dream, Kyle Polly and Mach and Natalian are son the Gemnin and the Davil se ya yuk. She am Dorov a yes Dorov of Al Nabeha. Ach, who get or a chili garash and a slatter in a variety of. It was just going to be two years of knuckling down and, and seeing what was possible, and I made myself, I got myself into the team, um, and it was kind of like this is the dream situation, you know, right at the last minute. I was looking like I was going to go to the Olympic Games and it was going to be home games and probably the most amazing Olympic Games of anyone's life, you know, um, which it was, it was amazing. Um, and then it was, would have been the May time um, my back went. So that was, that all just sort of crumbled away from me. Um, and yeah, it's, it's hard. I mean, I can't really describe how I got through it, but it was just like day by day and I knew I had a job to do to get better because I was living in a lot of pain and that's no good for anyone. And I thought, okay, well, just need to get myself to a point where I can live normal life, not injured, and then I'll reassess and see how I go to. So um, yeah, I just had a lot of support from my family and I feel very lucky for that. Um, and it got to the stage where I was like, okay, I'm now, it's, everything's looking better. Um, I look like I can move. Do I want to sacrifice everything and see if I can make a games? And, and I think there's just this sort of burning desire and nagging feeling inside of me that if I hadn't given it a proper shot and, and gone for the Rio games, then I'd probably regret it for the rest of my life. Bwani Polly Brown Arigat, I can Olympics Rio and in Davi as a Shia Jiuk. But the higher lay moisture less. I remember seeing this like wave of people in front of me just cheering and you know waving flags and the like smiles on their faces were just amazing and it just kind of 
I had a moment where I was like, I couldn't be happier than in this moment right here, right now. There's nothing, even if I had a gold medal on my neck, it, the feelings I'm feeling now would not be any different. This is just electric. It's amazing. Um, and yeah, I think coming home with that, it was just lovely to share that that excitement and, and those emotions with everyone. So, you know, it's amazing. You get sort of swept up into this whirlwind of events and going to see, you know, rowing clubs and primary schools and just everywhere. And, and it's, a, it's a great time in your life because you do, you do just get to share it with so many different people that you may not have met. And you realize there is a big, bigger purpose. It's not just your dreams and goals as an athlete. You know, the, the nation does um, support us and they, and they do will us on and, and it does like inspire a lot of people. And, um, I think that is very special. It's a very special part of being an athlete. Fa Paul Yertug or Sonagemin in Tokyo, I is her Pedocla Helen Glover. A Yan and Nak the Hila the Duish, Beth to the Sorich of Almian G Shaka. I still, I don't know that this feeling will ever go away, but I had this like itch that I just needed to scratch. I was kind of like, oh, I just need to go back and see if I can do it again. And Tokyo just sounded like it would be again an amazing games and there's this great bunch of women that are coming up through the ranks in, in GB rowing and um, I just thought okay maybe one last time I'll give it a while and I did think that I would probably just fall short and, and it wouldn't happen but obviously things kind of all fell into place and being able to row the pair with Helen was just fantastic we'd rode together before in 2013 and so we kind of knew each other we could work really well as a team and and I think with her story of being a mother and having made a comeback and then mine of being a doctor and making a comeback I think it was just yeah it was a very special year to to to, to do and yeah I don't think I would have anticipated it being like that but um yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a great journey and I've, I've loved it. It would have been great to have got the medal. Um, but I think looking back on it now, actually what we did was probably surpassed what we should have been capable of. And, and so I think we're both very proud of, of that as well. Ha poli moich job as na haia janus and spor saith gimar ha. Ta chan nyali jool dod na haia olympic sovun an in Paris fichith fich se keir. Sometimes I think, oh, Polly, just do it again. Like I, I would, I long to win and I long to be an Olympic champion. And then some. Sometimes I'll think about it and just think, "Wow, you've done a lot better than you thought you were cap. What you thought you were capable of." You know, when I was thirteen, I just, I was just a bit useless. It's so funny. I was just kind of enjoyed the sport and loved it, but like I say, not very good at pushing myself. So to come away with all those accolades, you kind of think it's a bit of a pinch you moment, you know. Um, and I think having those two sides of me is probably why I'm an athlete, isn't it? Because there's always there's always a possibility to do more and there's always a possibility better. Um, and I will probably always have that nagging thought if I decide to come back or I don't. I, I, I'm sure I'll be in my 60s and still be like, oh, I wonder what I can be that's better. Um, but yeah, at some point, I suppose we'll call it a day. So we'll see. I would love to row again. I would, I would love to try for Paris. But like I said, I'm 33, and at some point, sort of real life has to has to um, take a bit of a centre stage as well. So we'll see. We'll see. I'll never say never. <laughs>
I've still got this opportunity in that window just to maybe get that kind of reach that peak of peak of sport. Yeah, her humility came through. She was almost suggesting she had very little talent and kind of flicked her way into this scenario. And we all know that's not the case. You don't go to an Olympics, let alone medal, without an, an element of talent and commitment. But I certainly got a sense at the end that she wasn't quite finished with Rowan yet and she's got one eye perhaps on a, a final hurrah and as you say, maybe just that desire to get the gold is, is keeping her going. And that's one thing that she didn't mention, she is also a European and, gold, a European and world gold medalist. So there has been so much that she's achieved and like you kind of touched on with her job, again she didn't really go into it, but a very high intense job as a doctor and to kind of work alongside to have that and then have your sport at the same time takes a lot doesn't it and we see that so often in women's football yeah. and women's sport sorry in general no you're absolutely right and you see in women's football and it never ceases to amaze me that these women go and work all day, some of them, as you say, in quite intense roles in terms of what is expected of them in their work, and then they flick a switch and go to training four nights a week and perform at an elite level on the weekend. We're beginning to see a little shift. There's more and more professional players in the league, and you hope that allows them to get a little bit more rest and recovery between their football. But looking back over the years, some of the players that we have had representing our national team and even just playing domestically at the moment in our league, the jobs they do alongside the football, it's just an incredible level of commitment because there's a sacrifice there to be able to do that. There's probably a social element and family time that they will miss out on undoubtedly to be able to maintain that level. And you then, I suppose you then kind of see the differences in the teams that are full-time and professional and the teams that have women working full time. I mean, imagine coming off straight off, straight off night shift and into, into a football game against a team that are full time, it's hard. Yeah, and I hope there'll become a time that we come away from that and that isn't the situation and most players will have an element of a professional contract that allows them to get that sort of recovery and time pre-match. But I was up in Aberdeen last week for the Aberdeen Rangers game in Pataudry um, and we were speaking about this, you know, Aberdeen and Rangers were there and, you know, Aberdeen players worked that full day and made their way to Pataudry that night to play a massive game in their city and their stadium. You know, Rangers had that full day to prepare and travel and you know get their pre-match meal and the right number of hours before kick-off. So just that ability to prepare and to be fair to Aberdeen, they were brilliant in the game and really competed well against Rangers. But you could see in the later stages of the game that Rangers were professional and they just had a little bit more in their legs. But yeah, just incredible that, that level of commitment and to show that you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with professional athletes. That's something they should be really proud of. As more teams go professionally, you wonder if that's something that we will then see impact results and, and bridge that gap even more. Is that something that you want to see? Yeah, and I think we're beginning to see that gap closing. We've seen less big score lines this season and even teams are perhaps losing games. It's by one or two goals and we spoke about Hamilton earlier. You know, the amount of times they've kept themselves in the game up to 70 and 80 minutes and then lost that late goal, that, that's not coincidence. That is usually down to some form of fitness because you're playing against a full-time team that have just got that a little bit more. So I think the more f the full-time environment exists for female footballers, that gap will close more and more and games will be decided by the sort of tactics and the technical decisions on the pitch as opposed to maybe just that little bit of fitness towards the end of fixtures. You mentioned you were up at Pataudry and recently we had three games played, uh, one at Pataudry, one at Easter Road and one at Celtic Park because that's something you also want to see more of. Yeah, and we've seen a few of these, so I've been, I think, at Easter Road, Tyne Castle, up at Pataudry last week, and then back down to Celtic Park on Saturday, and it's brilliant. You, you can see just a club coming together in those moments, and the engagement with the fans and the players at the end, just really nice to see. But it is something that we're looking at in terms of the new setup. already sort of looking at the draft fixture calendar, if you like. We're trying to identify across the season perhaps moments where we could have a flagship women's football weekend, Maybe it coincides with the international men's break when there's not domestic men's football to compete with. So can we have flagship weekends across the season that we can work towards and get games in stadiums and really showcase the very best of women's football. But rather than it being that sort of ad hoc as and when, it's factored in over the year so that we can really drive and promote the clubs and get the audiences up more and more. But because it's worked already, you see the, the crowds that have gone to those games and the feedback's been really positive. So 
yeah, we definitely want to, to see more of that. And I suppose break more attendance records, which I know is so important just to push women's football and get it out there even more. Yeah, and we've seen some great attendances. I think the, the biggest was at Easter Road. I think they got nearly 6,000 or around about 6,000. But the crowds have been really significant at all of those games that we've been at. But I think with that longer lead in, a bit more of a strategy around the promotion collectively as a league to make that a, a real showcase moment every now and then over the course of the season. We've seen it work down south with the Super League so we can learn from what they've done and it, they've been really helpful actually. They, they're sort of an open door for us to call and get their advice on lessons learned. So yeah, I think it's a really exciting time and if we can factor in those big moments that people are excited about, it will be um, really interesting to see how that goes next year. Because even in terms of advertisement, I was just driving through Guruk the other day and there's a big board up for Scotland versus Spain World Cup qualifier coming up in a couple of weeks. Great to see that and I was so delighted to see that there. But as we know, it is a huge game. You've watched Scotland play Spain before. It's going to be hard, but even just crucial for Scotland to really get back together and push this World Cup qualification. Yeah, and I think that we need to remember Spain are one of the best teams in the world. I sat in Spain and watched that game and I think it was difficult for everyone to watch. And there was definitely learnings from a Scotland perspective. The, the players and the coaching staff would tell you that themselves. but. We need to keep in perspective just how good a team Spain are, but we're bringing one of the best teams in the world to our home stadium in Hamden and a World Cup qualifier, so that, that's an incredible moment. We want fans to come and watch that game and um, we're hopeful we'll get a good crowd. The whole dynamic of that window's obviously changed. We were supposed to have the, the two games, so we've now got a real sort of nine, ten day lead in to the fixture, so we're fully focused on Spain, which hopefully gives us that a little bit extra as well. All right, well, Fiona, it's so much happening. It was so great to have you on this week and hear all about all of the plans and we do really look forward to seeing all of the changes coming up. Thank you and thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Well, Shanair son and Nock, we program our lay Ayla Akengave and Achyachkin, Jen Keen Shachavel Shiva Lenten at BBC Albury YouTube or Son of Hula Fisher Cook, Cook Angle Cherry Three, Shaskit Ain, Kishin Shiva Nahuris. <laughs>